Good morning, y'all. Happy Perseverance Landing Day. Today we'll be talking about communications. Uh, a portion of it is the fundamentals of signals, and then the other portion of the lecture today is describing the link budget and how to put one together. So let's dive into the fundamentals of signals. Uh, this is going to be a pretty dense section, and I'll take my time on each slide. So at the very beginning, what is a signal and how do you classify different signals? Uh, there are two different types of signals. There are analog signals and digital signals. Um, the way that we perceive a lot of mother nature is continuous or analog signals. Most information that satellites measure and transmit is continuous in nature. Um, for example, some of these signals could be the spectral radiance of an image or the temperature of the battery. But the way that spacecraft handles sig uh, signals internal to the electronic circuits, the way that circuits process signals, it's easier to handle digital signals. So how do we get from analog signals, the way that we take in uh, data, to the way that we process data? There are analog to digital con converters um, where essentially you're taking an original analog signal um, and you can conduct sampling and quantization, where sampling is looking at discrete time measurements and then quantization is looking at discrete magnitude measurements. So you see here with these two processes, you can get digital signals. Um, there is some error that you accrue when you're converting an analog signal to a digital signal. You'll see here that the original signal is in green, the quantized signal is in yellow, and the accumulated error or the error uh, derived from quantization is in red here. Okay, let's move on. What are other effects that this digitization um, can affect the way that we interpret data? So there's something called aliasing, um, and that's related to something called the Nyquist theorem where aliasing is the interpretation of data given some sampling that could misconstrue you to think that the data looks a certain way when really if you sample at a higher frequency, you'll uncover the true signal. So here we have the original signal, which is this red and it's a higher frequency sinusoidal wave. If you sample at, what is it? Uh, 10 hertz, then you're not going to pick up on this uh, sinusoidal high frequency signal. Instead, you, it would be ambiguous whether it's the red signal or the blue signal. Um, so the way to get around that is on the bottom here, we have some real signal and we have some frequency of sampling where as you go up in frequency of sampling, you'll see that the orange line, which is a fit to the black dot data, the orange fit gets closer to the original true signal. So the rule of thumb here is to sample at two times the frequency of the underlying data. You can think of this as if you know what kind of frequency your science is going to be at, you wanna make sure that your payload and your onboard computer can handle sampling at that rate. So the question, here's a question. Why do we need to sample with a frequency of 2.2 uh, in practice versus the 2B in theory? I understand that it needs to be more often, but is there a reason that it is specifically 2.2? Uh, the reason why it's 2.2 times the bandwidth is because we want to add some margin in there. So two is going to give us the theoretical uh, precision to separate two signals apart, but then that extra 0.2 is to add margin to that. In implementation, um, we're going to stray away from theoretical calculations. Uh, so to compensate for that, we just add margin. 
Okay, so that was about signals. Uh, now we'll talk about coding, which is how do we handle the signals? Um, how do we handle the signals in such a way that we control the rate at which we're transmitting at and we're getting quality signals back? So the those two metrics, the data rate and the quality, are controlled by source coding and channel coding. So source coding, you can think of as methods to compress data, which decrease the data rate and you'll be able to stuff more data through a fixed amount of time. Whereas channel coding is to ensure that you get quality data back. So whether it's bit flips um, in your electronics or whether it's kind of interference when you're actually transmitting radio waves through free space, there could be errors in your data which you need to detect and correct for. Unfortunately, because um, there are added capabilities you need to embed into channel coding, you also increase the data rate. So there's some balancing of how much can we compress, um, but also how much can we ensure robustness in the, the quality of signal. Um, so let's go through just the general flow of you know, how data flows from the science to the mission operator. So we'll start out with the science. The source signal can come in the form of what? Imagery, video, audio, scientific data. Um, and then that data is filtered. So noise goes out. This is just an example um, flow. And then there is some source encoding where an encoder is something that converts data. Um, in this case, the source encoder converts a source signal into a smaller data format. And then we'll move on. We'll take that output, that smaller data packet size, and give it to the channel encoder. The channel encoder then detects any errors and corrects errors by adding redundant bits here and there. This packet that's been shrunk then expanded for redundancy so now we have some small and then enlarged data. Uh, it's passed to some modulation scheme. This modulated signal is transmitted from the spacecraft. In this case, it's transmitted through the space environment. It crosses that distance between the spacecraft to the ground station where that signal is then demodulated. So everything we did from science to spacecraft has to be undone and unpacked. So the data is, or the signal is demodulated. Then um, any kind of errors are detected and corrected. And then that data is decompressed. And then there's some post filtering. And then finally, that data reaches the mission operator. After this whole process, what you really want is for the original data, the original signal, to match what the mission operator sees. Okay, so now let's get into different methods for each kind of coding scheme. For source coding, remember the data compression methods, there are lossless compression and lossy compression methods. So lossless allows perfect reconstruction of the original signal. You work with these different compression schemes in your daily life. For example, zip files and PNG files are lossless compression schemes. Um, they include something like run length encoding, which is over here. You'll see that this longer string of symbols, these little bits, are converted or encoded into this smaller data packet, where run length encoding is just counting the amount of redundant bits in a series. Um, having that symbol, the number, symbol, number, symbol, number. Um, this is very useful for data sets where you have long strings of redundant information. Um, for example, if it's a black and white image and there are only a few spots of, uh, there are only a few black spots and 
a huge amount of white background, you would get a lot of compression or a lot of bang for your buck, for example. Now let's talk about, oh, on the left here is another way of doing lossless compression. Um, when it comes to lossy compression, some information is lost and perfect reconstruction is not possible, but you usually get a much higher reduction in bit rate. Examples include JPEGs and MP3 files. Now the question here is, when is lossy compression used instead of lossless compression? Um, I think that's a great question. Now, lossy compression will be utilized for data that is not exactly the most important or critical to a mission. Just some kind of gesture of that information is good enough to make decisions. So uh, lossy compression can be used for housekeeping data or images where um, Let's take the Perseverance rover, for example. Let's just see if the camera works or if um, you take an image and you just wanna ensure that like this is in a safe place, that the rover is upright, then you can compress that image because the skyline can be blurred just a little bit. Um, you don't care so much about the definition of the image, more so just a general understanding of what's going on. So that's when you would um, send back a lossy compression that is highly compressed. Um, it comes in a smaller packet, so you can send much more of it back home much sooner. Whereas if you were to do like refined science operations, if you were to do terrain relative navigation, uh, perhaps you would instead send back this lossless compression where you want high definition features of the environment. Okay, channel encoding is uh, a coding scheme to ensure that the data is received in the same way that the data was sent and it adds redundancy bits strategically to avoid errors. So there are two activities, detection and correction. So let's just look here. Um, here is a detection method where you just check the sum of the bits. Um, if the sum is equal to zero, then there were no errors, or maybe there were two errors. The counterpart is that if the sum of the bits is equal to one, then it's not okay. There is an error but with error detection, this method doesn't correct, it just detects. So what then do we do to error correct? So let's say that we receive uh, three different packets. If we receive these three different packets and we know that the error detection is it sums to one, then you can take one of the bits that does not belong and then correct it to zero, zero, zero. Oh my gosh. Um, so that is the most likely solution to that error correction method. If, for example, these packets, um, the majority of these bits are ones, and it's likely that that zero is out of place and then we correct to 111. Um, there are definitely more sophisticated correction coding schemes out there, but that's just an example of how you would correct. Um, here is a block diagram up here as to how the flow of data would go if you were to embed channel coding inside. So you have your original data bits and then you have a parity generator, some kind of counter, this error detection. Um, and then you add in that data plus that parity that allows for you to, it's kind of like embedding some kind of intermediate product so that you can detect an error. Um, then you send it through a channel which has noise 
if that noise were to add error into that data and signal, then you would be able to detect an error and send a request to retransmit. So that's where that parity generator came in. It's that um, like a predefined structure uh, embedded into this data packet that was elongated into data and um, error redundancy that allowed us to detect noise. Uh, if we detect an error, we can request a retransmission. Do the CubeSets have this level of interaction or do they just data dump when in range of a ground station? So it depends on the quality of the, the source code that's underneath. Um, CubeSats are just so diverse and so many. Um, we, in Cosmos, I'm hoping that we have this kind of capability already embedded. I think it's a good practice to do. But given that CubeSats are also high risk, maybe it's not that big of a deal if a bit is flipped or there's some error in the data. The channel coding, the redundancy is really important for missions that necessitate quality data. So if you're okay with pretty shoddy data for your CubeSat mission, then maybe you don't embed channel coding. Um, now the second half of the question, do they just data dump when in range of a ground station? I think these are two exclusive events. You can embed channel coding and then data dump when in range of a ground station. But yeah, I think as much as possible, satellites, spacecraft want to dump as much data as possible when in range of a ground station. Okay. Um, this bottom process right here, this could be, uh, okay, so this is showing the transmitter, which is our satellite. Uh, during transmission, the receiver is automatically doing that error detection. Um, if the ground station is in real time processing this data and realizes that there is some error, then let's see, we go to this stage right here where there's a no acknowledgement um, so that satellite or spacecraft retransmits that data. So you see here that there is some partitioning of the entire data packet that you want to send into five partitions where you send the first partition of data and you only send the second partition when the ground station acknowledges that the data packet was good. So you do this, um, yeah, until an error is detected and then you halt and then retransmit until you get all five partitions down. Okay, so we have been going sequentially into how signals are originally measured by spacecraft, how they are encoded, um, first by compressing and then by adding redundancy. Now the next phase of the next life cycle of a signal could be modulation, where modulation is, um, right before you transmit the signal, you have to modulate it. Um, why? Because the analog signal or the, the original signal that you measured are typically at very low frequency signals. Um, but for spacecraft, low frequency signals would require extremely large antennas, which may not be feasible. And also low frequency signals have huge atmospheric losses so instead, we want to encode low frequency signals, our science data, um, into high frequency signals. And the way to do that is modulation. So modulation is the combination of some lower frequency signal, typically. Um, you mix it with some carrier signal. A carrier signal is typically an oscillator, a high frequency oscillator. Uh, and then your modulated signal in the end looks like this. 
where it's some combination of the original signal of interest and your carrier signal. Now that ultimate um, modulated signal, in this case, it's an amplitude modulated signal, but you can also convert uh, this information into frequency and phase information that modifies this carrier signal. Uh, there are, so the three types of modulations are shown here. The first one is an amplitude. The frequency signal is shown here where the amplitude of your data signal dictates the frequency at which you are transmitting your carrier signal at. So you'll see here that um, during this crest, there's a very dense signal and during a trough, there's a not so dense. So that frequency is varying in the ultimate modulated signal. Now let's look at this phase modulated signal. We have um, the signal of interest in blue, and then we have the carrier signal in red. And when you combine those together, you'll see that the blue signal um, is where a phase would be in the carrier signal equation. So this is what the, the product or output of combining these two signals in a phase modulated way would look like. Is there a question? Oh, um, is there any advantage to using analog signals? So analog signals are great because they are the original signal. Um, you get a lot, of, because they're continuous, they are like infinitely resolvable. And what do I mean by that? Um, you don't have quantization error. Remember where you had to chunk up the magnitudes um, because that's how digital signals need to handle data. Well, analog signals, you have, you can break up that signal into just infinitesimal, infinitesimally small chunks and it will still retain some slope information. That's what continuity is. But analog circuits are really hard to design and build. So that's the reason why we handle our signals in spacecraft digitally. But yes, there is, there is advantage to using analog signals. Um, for example, in our everyday lives, record players are, are analog. Um, and so you get that, you get a more beautiful sound because it's cleaner, it's crisper. Whereas if you were to convert that analog signal to digital, there's some of that noise, that static noise that would be embedded into the track, for example. What else? Um, I think base amplifiers are also analog if you get a really good expensive one. Anyway, yes. So there are advantages to analog signals. All right, let's break it down. So we just saw analog modulation. Now let's dig into digital modulation, which is what most spacecraft use. So just like analog modulation, there are three parameters that we play with. There's amplitude, frequency, phase. So here, here we see that the original digital signal is some binary step. It's either a one or a zero. The way that the transmitted signal would look like is you see that carrier frequency, uh, but the amplitude of the carrier signal varies. And so this is what the modulated signal would look like. Um, for frequency, here's the original data, here's the carrier. Uh, remember we were talking about peaks and troughs. So high frequency peak, low frequency trough. That's what the modulated signal would look like. Here we have uh, phase. Yeah, so phase where this high would 
logic one produces no phase change. So this carrier would, this carrier signal would just look like what it was. But once we get to zero, the signal would flip to a 180 degree phase change. That's why you see this uh, discrete change right here. I mean, that's why you'll see a discrete change when that zero flips to a one. So that's why you'll see, this is what the modulated signal for a phase shifted um, modulation scheme would look like. Now here I have, you can break down these frequency, amplitude, and phase shift keying into different resolutions. So the first number shows you how many digital steps there are in this, uh, this modulation scheme or shift keying. For a binary scenario, we have two FSK or binary frequency shift keying where you only have two frequencies that you're toggling between. That's this situation over here. But let's say you have four frequencies that you can shift between, so four different levels. You can encode more data into these, uh, into more bins. So that's an advantage. But a uh, disadvantage is if you separate these bins into too many bins, and the bins are too close together, then when your receiver is picking up on this signal, maybe it wouldn't be able to resolve the number of bins that you are trying to transmit at, especially if there's noise, uh, if there's noise injected into the signal. So I just wanted you to get comfortable with the like naming conventions. The number in front is the, the number of levels, um, that first letter is going to be an F, an A, or a P, given that it's frequency, amplitude, or phase. Um, and then shift keying is just like the digital modulation scheme. Okay, analog or digital. Is it cheaper and easier to develop satellites when using analog communications? So I touched on this earlier, and I'll give a more full response. Um, the advantage of analog modulation is that it conserves bandwidth and analog frequency, sorry, start over. The advantage of analog amplitude modulation conserves bandwidth and analog frequency modulation spreads information bandwidth over larger RF bandwidth. Bandwidth is data rate. Digital pulse code modulation, particularly phase shift keying, uses RF power more efficiently. Not very long ago, we did everything with analog and could never think of going digital, mainly due to the cost factor. Then came integrated circuits. At first, only a few gates were put in one package and the digital circuits were yet pretty elaborate. As the density of transistors began increasing on a single chip, the cost of digital functions began falling down and an increasing number of applications began shifting from the analog domain to the digital domain. Another trend began setting up. The domains of software technology and of memory technology began growing. The digital domain is robust, flexible, intensive, extensive, fault tolerant, compact, and power scrumptious. Digital is replacing analog almost everywhere. Digital is cheaper than analog in many ways now. The implementations are cheaper in terms of total component cost. The designs are reusable, which means the cost of designing is not repeated. Uh, power savings and compact designs lead to inexpensive solutions. Unlike analog dis signals, digital signals can be encoded into self-correcting codes and sent over long distances without fear of garbling, and that saves costs. Um, in contrast, analog signals would reach the far end completely battered out of shape and useless, which increase, increases costs. Yeah, I um, hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, so now I think we've covered the path of a signal going from science to transmission. Um, and you can think of the rest of the life cycle going to the mission operator as just the inverse of those processes. So I, that's the end of like the life of a signal. Um, now we'll just talk about 
terminology, there's something called bit error rate. You'll see it as BER. Um, and so let's just do a quick conceptual check of what BER is. Say that you have this transmitted bit sequence um, and then you, this is what was transmitted, but here's what's received, where the, these numbers that are underlined are the, the bits that were flipped or have an error in them. In this case, we have 10 total bits and three of them are wrong. So the bit error rate is three. Uh, sorry, the bit error rate is 0.3 or 30%. Now, this is just a simple example. In reality, we have typical BERs or bit error rates on the order of 10 to the negative 5. What affects bit error rate are signal to noise ratio, um, which is, you'll see this a lot too, EB over NO, where E is energy, N is noise, so bit energy to noise density. Uh, the modulation chosen, so we were talking about earlier, the closeness of bins, the number of levels, so that can also affect the bit error rate. You'll see that um, bit error rate goes down as you quantize into more levels, bit error rate goes down if you modulate closer to binary into fewer bins. Uh, let's describe what EB and, and uh, the signal to noise ratio is. In digital communication or data transmission, Energy per bit to noise power spectral density ratio is a normalized signal to noise ratio. This is essentially signal to noise ratio per bit. It is especially useful when comparing the bit error rate performance of different digital modulation schemes without taking bandwidth into account, um, where bandwidth is data rate. So intuitively, if signal power is in watts, E, um, and bit rate is in bits per second, EB is in units of joules, watt seconds. NO is the noise spectral density, the noise power in a one hertz bandwidth measured in watts per hertz or joules. Yay, okay. so got through the fundamentals of signals. Now let's talk about link budgets. 